Well, good afternoon. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about opportunity in a way that I hope is consistent uh, with the values and goals of ARC and the issues that we've been talking about today. So I want to talk about opportunity from the perspective of the child. And that means thinking about opportunity as pathways along which the child will develop the human capital and the social capital that she needs not only to survive but to thrive in the 21st century. And by human capital I mean the cognitive skills and knowledges but also the interpersonal skills, the intrapersonal skills that she will need. And by social capital I mean the family bonds, the social networks that provide support, protection and also guides for normative behavior that will uh, protect that child over her lifetime. Now what's not really underst well understood, I think, but is nonetheless true, certainly in the United States and I believe in many other countries as well, that over the last two generations, human capital and social capital have become much more tightly coupled. What that means is that those who have more human capital tend to have more social capital. And those with lesser human capital, unfortunately, have lesser social capital. And that has important consequences that I'll talk about in a minute. Now I said that I wanted to talk about opportunity from the, spec from the perspective of the child, but it logically makes sense to first talk about the adults who are going to establish the family environment in which the child is born and in which he or she develops. And I'm going to use three words to frame my conversation. And the three words are gates, gaps, and gradients. I'm a great fan of alliteration, as you will see. <laughs> Now, I'm going to use the term gradients to represent the relationship between an individual stock of human and social capital on the one hand and their adult outcomes on the other. Adult outcomes like success in the labor market, a success in forming a family, a success in raising children. And what we've seen over the last certainly 40 or 45 years is that the gradients have become more and more steep. And that means that differences in human social capital mean more than ever in terms of success in those adult outcomes. Now think about what the combination of steepening gradients and the closer coupling of human and social capital mean. What it says to me is that if we array families along some continuum of ability to nurture their children, that instead of the normal curve with the big happy peak in the middle, what's happened is that peak has become squashed down. Families move to the right, higher and, and better environments, but more and more families moving to the left. Maybe you're right. Uh, but representing those families who are less able, less in a position to provide the nurturing environment their children need. And the result is that over time, Children are born in a more and more diverse environments. And as they look along those opportunity pathways, they will see gates. Those gates, for me, are the markers along important transition points. For some children, those gates are open. And they have a free and clear path to accumulate human and social capital in a timely manner. But too many children see gates that are closed or perhaps only slightly ajar. And for them, there are many obstacles to accumulating that human and social capital. And it often requires heroic efforts on their part and on the part of their parents, guardians, neighborhoods to assure them some chance in achieving those stocks of human and social capital that they need. What are examples of those gates? Well, think about early childhood, right? We need to talk about pre and postnatal care. We talk about adequate nutrition, about growing up in an environment which is low stress, uh, non-toxic where there is an opportunity to develop um, strong maternal attach attachments, uh, to develop uh, under cognitive stimulation. What we know, and it's already been referred to, is that by the time children reach school age, there are already enormous gaps. And what is very, very worrisome and problematic already is that those gates and gaps interact over the lifetime of the child, so that early gaps lead to closed gates later on. For example, 
Children who fall behind in school are then denied access to more advanced classes, to the better teachers, to the better schools. And so by the time they reach 18, 22, the gaps in stocks of capital that they need are already enormous with important implications for their adult lives. What that tells us is that that early childhood environment casts a long shadow on children's developmental trajectories. And what happens then is we're seeing more and more a very strong intergenerational transmission of advantage and disadvantage. And the consequence is impaired intergenerational social mobility. Well, that's a pretty bleak picture. Uh, what are schools going to do? Well, ideally, schools are there to open gates, right? And to close the gaps. And for many children, that is exactly what they do. But for too many children, they're unable to do that. Lack of capacity, other reasons, and children fall by the wayside. But I think anyone who works in schools where there's a large proportion of children coming from disadvantaged families, homeless children, foster children, and so on, will tell you that the problems are more than any school can or should be able to do. That this is a comprehensive problem that requires comprehensive solutions. And I would argue that this is an urgent problem. Urgent because the forces that are driving that steepening of gradients that I talked about, the forces that are driving the closer coupling of human and social capital, whether it's residential segregation, uh, uh, assortative mating, and so on, and also the closer coupling of private investment and public investment, means that we are seeing children increasingly follow divergent destinies. And that's going to lead to a further fraying of the social fabric and undermining the democratic polity that we all cherish. So I would argue that as systems, we need to think about strategic uh, approaches that are comprehensive. And I'm going to offer a couple of uh, ideas. And again, I'm going to use my alliteration. They have to be systemic, systematic, and sustainable. Systematic meaning that they have to involve interventions that follow the child entirely along, entirely along their developmental trajectory. And that requires systemic interventions from all the resources that the state, that the neighborhoods, private organizations, NGOs, etc., can offer to help create those uh, systematic interventions with warm handoffs from one point to another. And finally, we need to be sustainable over many generations because the problems we're seeing today arose over two or three generations. Uh, they're not going to go away in five years or 10 years. We need a 20 or 40 year strategy. And if we don't, uh, we will see these divergent destinies lead to uh, social unrest, economic unrest, and an undoing of everything that we have built up since World War II. So I urge us to consider immediate action, comprehensive action, and a strategic partnership among all the resources. Thank you very much. Thank you.